Thanks for tuning in to the Proline Handicapping Show on the web. Coming up, the panel focuses on bowl games this week, featuring Saturday's contest between San Jose State and New Mexico, Thursday's game between Oklahoma State and Alabama, and next Friday's matchup between Minnesota and Texas Tech, as well as Sunday's pro battle between the Chargers and the Seahawks. But first, let's hear from our Proline panelists. Welcome back to week four of our web show. Uh, the first three shows have been a lot of fun to do. This one, I think, is going to be even the best because we get into the bowls. We, we have a lot of excitement. Come, you know, the playoff matchups, the potential in the NFL is just incredible. So I think we're going to get started off. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the NBA, though. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we have the big brawl, uh, all the suspensions. Uh, do you think they were suspended enough, fined enough? Is there ever enough? I mean, they, they, you know, you make $15 million a year and you get suspended and you lose 500000 Does it really matter? I don't think it matters a lot to the guys when it comes to that because they don't, they don't find them enough. But the thing is, I'm watching these games and I'm like, I'm hearing about it's a representation of the society today and all and stuff like that and this sucker punch by Carmelo, which that was a cheap shot. Uh, but do you remember Dave Cowens? Oh, yeah. Did he get into a fight every other night? I mean, basketball in the 50s was probably the roughest it ever was. Uh, in the 70s, you, like I said, you had Dave Cowens, you had the Detroit Pistons and the Bad Boys for most of the late 80s into the early 90s. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, I think it's a little bit of, of an overreaction. I think Carmelo you give the big suspension to because you don't come along and sucker punch a guy. I like, if you the, do, way, you might I like have a, the way he sucker punched him and then backed, and then up, backed up through up. the whole court. Yeah. Hey, let me I tell mean, you something. If Carl wants to quit the NBA, he could probably go right into the NFL as defensive back because, you know, you've got to be able to move quick backwards. Man, that guy, that guy <laughs> really knows how to <laughs> backpedal. How about this, though? You know, fighting in hockey is acceptable. Yeah. It's actually encouraged. But what he could really go into that league mm, and, and do But what they've you know done what the is difference he couldn't is, though, in hockey – the players can't take their fight into the stands, and I think that's one of the big concerns. It's been a long time since they've done it. They used yeah. to. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing they did in hockey several years ago is they made that rule where there's a third man in rule in hockey. You could be between the two combatants, if you will, on the ice, the two goons, which has kind of been lessened also because of these yeah. European rules that have come into play over the last couple of years. So Carmelo would actually have to stand there and fight. I don't think he could make it. You can't back up? He'd probably fall on his rear end if he did. He'd probably <laughs> slip and fall on his ass, and that'd be it. The bottom line is, though, I, I think that uh, it's a little bit of an overreaction by the media. And well, speaking of Carmelo, I mean, leading scorer in the league, he's out for 15 games. Uh, I'm sure during that time his game will get a little rusty as well. And then they bring in Iverson. What do you think? Oh, I th you know what? When you consider the over-the-barrel situation for the 76er squad, everybody in the, in the league knew that they were going to unload him. Uh, the other option was uh, to, just to leave him on the team the whole season and not get in for him. Uh, I wondered about just what they could get, and I think that uh, at first look you say, hey, not too bad. you got a couple of starters. you get got two first-round draft picks in 2007. The starters, obviously, you got to replace your point guard, Andre Miller, who uh, I think he's averaging about eight assists a game. Very good, but I tell you what, the problem with him, he just doesn't have an outside game. Right. Uh, people play back on him despite that. If, if that wasn't the case, if he could shoot better, he'd probably average 10, 11 assists. Uh, Joe Smith, what he plays, but he's not a bad ball player, but boy, it's every other game where he's mm -hmm. sitting down uh, uh, injured for one reason or another. So uh, I guess they didn't get a lot, but then again, what more could they have expected? I mean, teams just knew that. How that about from really, Denver's perspective? What do you think there? I think it'll help them. I really do. And I mean, what, happens, what happens when Carmelo comes back? I mean, you still only have one basketball. Well, that's the thing. I, I think the best spot for Allen Iverson, my opinion, is Minnesota. Minnesota. Would have been Minnesota. Kevin Garnett wanted him there. Iverson wanted to have that whole you know, almost an inside-outside thing. You can't just say it's inside with Garnett because he shoots the 10-foot jumper so much, but it would have been, I thought, a great fit because Iverson can drive the paint all he wants, and if the shot's not there, which is about once every 50 times he drives, he doesn't shoot, but drive the paint <laughs> and then kick it out to Kevin Garnett, and he can hit that 10-foot that jumper because defenders have to pack it in when Iverson drives the paint. Uh, for Denver now, they've got adequate point guards besides Andre Miller that were sitting the bench and sharing time with Miller when, when Miller would start the games. I, I did see something with... You mentioned when, what happens when Carmelo comes back. He's, I think, going to be, they're talking about Iverson probably having to play about 12 games without Carmelo. Mm -hmm. Now, when Carmelo comes back, he's already mentioned, and this shows you that it's on his mind. He said, we're both going to be able to get our shots. We'll both be able to score our points. Well, if that's the first thing he says about the trade, then Carmelo's already thinking that some of the attention is going to be taken away from Carmelo. 
Doesn't it sound that way to you guys if you well, read between the lines? I mean, he's already it, talking it, about, well, it, we'll both get our maybe, points. Maybe, but he's really, he's asked for this trade for, for a month now. So why do you ask for something if you really think it might not be I, yeah. beneficial to you? Who knows? I think it's good for this year, but I think they gave away too much be, uh, because of Iverson's age. I think it's good for this year. But if they all of a sudden kind of, you know, sputter, let's say, after they, get, after they both get on the court and they get everybody together, if they sputter for a while, this could cause a lot of problems. I mean, but but you know. what did they lose? I mean, really. I mean, they've got plenty of frontline people. Like I said, Joe Smith is, I think he's 31 years old, not going to play an awful lot. had an outside shot of making the Western yeah. Conference Finals, yeah. so they better not tweak it too much. Mm. Be interesting to watch as, as, as the first 12 games, as you said, and then after that, uh, after he sits out for so many games and comes back into and how they blend it. You think overall it'll help them for this year? I think so. I'm, I'm yeah. guessing, but yeah. I mean, Ivers is such an incredible talent. I think at least for the first season they'll work well together. Who knows? After and by that. the way, George Carl's my hero, so I'm rooting for him big time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he finally just came out and said it like it is when it comes to Isaiah Thomas. So <laughs> boy, didn't he? You know, I, so you got to like George Carl, and I always root for him anyway. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting, like you said, because the first ten or twelve games that Iverson's there, it's going to be his ball team, and then when Carmelo comes back, Iverson may talk the talk, but we'll have to see if he walks the walk and realizes that it is Carmelo's Denver Nuggets. And he's going to have to play second fiddle a little bit. If they're winning from the start, they'll be fine. But if they go through a five or six game stretch where they lose, you know, let's say four out of five out of six games, and they're having their problems on the court and getting Carmelo enough shots, it might cause a little bit of friction. You know, speaking of Isaiah Thomas, I mean, as a basketball player, very few people were revered as much as he was. A great player, mm -hmm. great on the court leader. But since he's gotten out of basketball and went into management and coaching, it's been horrible. Well, he brought in a lot of the attributes that he learned under Bobby Knight. Uh, the first, he was only there for a couple of years, but he learned a lot under Bobby Knight and had that, has that same kind of fire or intensity I think that, that Knight has. And then, of course, he was one of the members of the bad boys, the Detroit Pistons, who were mm -hmm. throwing elbows every two seconds on the court and bodying guys around. And the problem is, is that guys like Bobby Knight and Chuck Daly, who coached the bad boys, they seem to have an IQ much higher than Isaiah Thomas, at least a basketball off-court IQ. Because when it comes to putting things together, has there been anybody worse no, than Isaiah Thomas in the last 10 or 12 has, years? His, the last 10 years, he's been really looked down upon and the job he's done off the court. There's sure. no question about it. The NFL, I mean, we, we buried Rex Grossman a couple of weeks ago, said this guy needed to be benched. I was right there. At the, I was the leader of that. And, of course, he comes out in the next two games and plays lights out. <laughs> uh, we said the Indianapolis Colts couldn't stop anybody, but... Um, I guess we forgot that they could score enough to outscore other teams, and they could definitely stop Cincinnati. So those things reversed. You know what? Going into that ball game, that, that cincinnati Indianapolis Colt game, uh, I commented about how everyone figured that this was a game that featured the, 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 the rush attack of Cincinnati against the rush defense of the Colts, which is, you understand why, because, of course, the Colts are giving up 150, 160 yards per game. But uh, I think people didn't look at it in other terms. It was also a Cincinnati offense against a, a Bengal defense. And also, if you go back the last eight, nine games this year, uh, Cincinnati had averaged something like 3.4 yards per carry. This wasn't the perfect team to attack, exactly. I think, to I attack think this Colt defense. This offensive line, which is kind of patchwork anyway it is. for Cincinnati, isn't like the Jaguars, which ripped them apart mm -hmm. a week earlier. So, and by the way, we didn't mention uh, Dave isn't here with us this week. He's, he's not feeling well, and we hope he'll be back next week. Um, Rex Grossman, Chicago. What about these teams like, like Chicago? that have clinched their position going up against other teams either desperate for a win or just playing out the season and kind of like um, they're, they're, it's a free-for-all for them. They can just go out there and do anything they want. Is it a dangerous spot for these clubs? I mean, you see the, the mm -hmm. point spreads adjusted quite a bit. I mean, Chicago's line this week is so low com yeah. compared <clears throat> to what it would normally be. How do you approach those? Well, I look at it this way. First of all, they have been adjusted. It's a good point already for what everybody's thinking on the street. And so you can't just base a play on the fact that a team must win because must win doesn't usually mean will win. And if a team's in a must win situation right now, that means they weren't that good because mm -hmm. now they're in a must win situation to make it to the postseason. So be real careful when it comes to that. For one thing, as Jim mentioned, the line's already been adjusted. Uh, so I do look at it from that perspective. I mean, I'm going to go right back to the matchups. I'm going to look and see maybe which lines have been adjusted, maybe a little bit too much. 
Uh, and that's one of the key things that I try to do in my handicapping this juncture of the season. I still like to dance with a lot of the ugly chicks. I take the ugly chicks to the dance and try to turn them into prom queens <laughs> when it comes to this time in pro football. And, and we've done real well basically since the first week in November, well, taking a lot of ugly teams. school days, the dancing with the... <laughs> <laughs> That was well, too easy. From Nebraska, there wasn't a whole you lot can't, of choices yeah, for Mr. Spreitzer. You Spreicher. can't hurt me with that. I know. I but can't. anyway. <laughs> you're really, you're going to get us in a lot of trouble with the girls in Nebraska, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, you know uh, talking about, I just wanted to talk real quickly about Cincy and Indianapolis. And if I was a team that was going to be playing Indianapolis in the first you know, couple of matchups of the uh, playoffs, I'd be looking at the Cincinnati game plan that they had offensively and saying we better not get caught up in this Indianapolis has a horrible run defense mentality because look at what Cincy did on offense. They completely changed what they normally do. They made it easier for Indianapolis to stop the run because they came out and said, we're going to run the ball every play almost. We're going to run it three out of four plays in that whole first half. That's all they did, run the ball between the tackles, run the ball between the tackles. They actually took themselves, the Indianapolis's run defense is so bad that the Cincinnati offensive coaching staff took themselves out of the regular game plan to try to take advantage and of what it. They, and and it what they them. forgot was their offensive line is bad. And their running <laughs> game isn't good enough to right. really put themselves in that position. Exactly. I missed that as well when I looked at the game. I said, there, you know, I was looking at how bad Indianapolis mm -hmm. defense was, not considering this isn't the same running team that the Jaguars were the week right. before. And, and I made a little mistake there. Yeah. I you know, it's, it's interesting, too. I mean, let's, let's face it. The reason Cincinnati got on a streak after a slow start this year was the fact that they kept throwing the ball downfield. They've got a great quarterback, super receivers. And then to just go away from that, yeah. I mean, really takes oh, a it was great for us that we're on Indianapolis. Yes, I mean, I was, was talking to another handicapper, emailing back and forth. Midway to the second quarter, I'm like, wow. They've completely flopped their game plan to try to take advantage of a soft interior defense and run right at them. They're throwing the ball on third and eight when they do throw it which means he's under pressure because Indianapolis does have quick defensive very, linemen who can get to quick. the quarterback and put pressure on him. And I'm thinking, boy, we've got to get as many points as we can out of Peyton Manning in this first half because you know since he's going to change in the second half, going to make the adjustment. They didn't adjust, so Indy goes on to win. So uh, bad coaching by the Cincinnati Bengals as far as I'm concerned. A lot of focus in this show and next week as well on the bowl games. and um, Talking to the people out there, how, how do you approach bowl games? What do you look for? Uh, in, in, in handicapping a bowl game, most of them are on neutral sites, not mm -hmm. all of them. Um, do you look at the coaches? Do you look at the different styles in the different leagues? Because you have these leagues mixed up now. You get you know, from one conference mm -hmm. to another. Different talent, uh, recruiting styles are different <coughs> type of players, the speed of the players, the size of the players. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach it? Well, I look at two things. I mean, obviously, you handicap games. You've still got to go with all your basics for handicapping. But during the bowls, the first thing I look for, I look and see how teams did on the road. Because with rare exceptions, Boise for a while getting to play all their games at home. Uh, this year, one of the games we're talking about, we've got a home team. I can't New, Mexico. Oh, New Mexico. Yeah. But, I mean, basically, it's two teams having to play on a neutral site. Mm -hmm. So if you look at those two squads, see how they did during the year on the road, it certainly gives you a little bit of an idea how they'll perform in this contest. The second thing is, and I'm not telling anybody anything new, I think seven of the last eight years, underdogs have outperformed favorites. I mean, this is just a long 30, 40 year trend. Uh, but I do warn people, if you're gonna look at playing underdogs in the bowls, look more strongly on the teams that play before New Year's Day as opposed to New Year's Day on. Because obviously, these teams playing in the earlier games, a lot of times they match up uh, an underdog team that's just overjoyed the fact that they're gonna be in a bowl game, whereas the favorites are usually teams, or quite often are teams that are a little disappointed. They thought they were gonna be playing in a New Year's Day bowl. And of course, you'll find that, uh, oh, if you look back over the years, they've done, the dogs have done not much better in those earlier games than later Pre -BCS. on. Pre-BCS. Pre-BCS. BCS yes. comes along and it's kind of changed things. It's, it's, it used well, to sure be almost cut and dried. Play, you know, either, either play a dog or pass a game before New Year's Day and play the favorites after New Year's Day. But since the BCS formula has come into the mix, it's not, it's not cut and dried anymore. No. Uh, you do tend to still play more dogs pre-New Year's Day, but those post-New Year, New Year's Day and after games are also covering underdogs are. I mean, last year it was uh, ridiculous. The, I'm trying to think off the top of my head now, 19-9 uh, against the spread underdogs last year. And if you played the money line, you cleaned up. You were 13-15 and 15 yeah, straight money up, line even better, which huh? sounds bad, 13-15, and 15, but when you're considering <laughs> the money line prices, you're getting two, three to one on you made money. a really good <laughs> I chunk mean, the of first, change. The first bowl game was just absolutely a blowout. Uh, yeah. TCU, uh, Northern Illinois. 
Um, well, sometimes you have to, you know, I mean, sure, you look at underdogs, but sometimes the matchups are just overwhelming in one team's favor. And you know what you, else? Here's the thing about Here's a great example with that first bowl game, the Poinsettia Bowl the other night in San Diego. When you look at those two teams, I heard a lot of people saying, well, TCU's disappointed to be played in this game. They had, you know, higher aspirations before the season began. They thought they were going to represent the Mountain West and, you know, so on and so on. Northern Illinois was just as disappointed to be in this game because before the season began, not only did they think they had a legitimate Heisman Trophy candidate in Garrett Wolf, they felt they were the team to beat in the MAC. You had two teams that were highly disappointed. And when that happens, I'm going to look and see who's got the better team on the field. So during the regular season, there were a lot of bowl teams, like for instance, coming up that I will play on that I wouldn't have played on if it was a regular season game in the same particular matchup because those teams may be more interested than the favorite now. Uh, in this particular bowl contest and in the regular season you're just talking about head-to-head -head matchups both teams trying to win wanting to win wanting to be there uh, and that's the case with that first game I looked at it I had TCU I looked at it as though both teams are disappointed to be here yeah it is a big line and last year double-digit dogs or I should say not last year but the last couple of years double-digit dogs are on a 29 and 19 spread run but double-digit favorites are 40 and 8 straight up so what that told me going into this game is I got two disappointed teams for what the bully ended up in. So I'm going to throw that out of the mix. I'm going to treat this like a regular season game, and I'm going to match up strengths against weaknesses. And I found a whole lot of weaknesses on Northern Illinois, their passing game for one, their offensive line for another, matched up against a TCU squad that plays incredible defense and can run the football. They can run the spread option. They can throw a little bit with Ballard, three guys running for better than 400 yards on the season. So I got to treat it as though it was a regular season game. And, boy, it's nice when you can find that come bowl time because yeah. you don't often you know you don't often see that in the bowl games sounds like we're really punishing northern illinois but let's remember too they lost their their starting quarterback, yeah, quarterback. Quarter horvat yeah. all season yeah. long uh, you know with for well, the, that was another another game. edge for sure sure for tcu uh we've been talking about some uh, neutral sites for bowl games but we're going to come right back and we're going to talk about the new mexico bowl which ironically is being <laughs> held in new mexico <laughs> and it's san jose against uh, new mexico we'll be right back <clears throat> In a moment, the panel breaks down the New Mexico Bowl with San Jose State and New Mexico. But first, Glenn McGrew, who had another great weekend in college basketball, hitting 70% winners with his pro-line offer and high-end personal service plays combined, has a five-game offer available completely free of charge. We're going to get to our first bowl game analysis in just a second. Bear with me, though. i got to talk about last week. Another winning pro-line offer, 3-2 and two on my five-game package. Of course, my high-end plays have been ridiculous the past month. 4-1 and one last weekend with high-end who plays. NBA, it's been terrific since week one. 193 units up on the season. And college basketball, 190 units the last four weeks. So I'm going to stick with hoops basically this week for you too. I'm going to give you three college size highlighted by my TV game of the month. Plus you're going to get details on my chalkboard game of the month in pro basketball and my side on Saturday's Fort Worth Bowl. It's Utah up against Tulsa. That's also going to be free. That's a super five game package for a great price. Zero, nothing. Give me a call 1-800-531-7069. Five big plays. Now, our first bowl game we're going to talk about this year, actually, huh? 45 years since New Mexico has won a bowl game. Even though, <laughs> even though they've been in the bowl for the last five years. 45 years! That's as old as I am. Yeah, oh, well, right. you're not quite that old, are you? Close. Okay. Close. <laughs> and San Jose, I mean, this is their first bowl appearance since 1990. So you, you have two teams that are, you know, off the charts about bowl games. But... Uh, Throwing the ball around, San Jose does like to do that. I mean, you definitely have a home court advantage to New Mexico. But I look for a very high-scoring game. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, if you watched, I got to see New Mexico in person when they played out here against UNLV, and I'm a glutton for punishment, but I love college football, so I go to all the UNLV home games. But it gives me a little bit of heads up in the Mountain West with some of these teams. And, and I watched a shootout. I, I believe the final score was something like 38-36 in favor of the Lobos. And if you've got a decent quarterback who can throw the football, which UNLV started doing when they brought in Shane Steichen in that game, by the way, uh, in place of Rocky Hines. They were able to throw all day for the final three quarters. In fact, I think they put up 21 points in about a seven-minute span just firing the football all around. So an over wouldn't surprise. Also got a great angle on WAC teams as far as totals are concerned. 14-5 and five to the over 
in their last 19 bowl games. And mm. that might be a little surprising because it's not as high-powered of a conference as it once was when you just thought, wow, whack, that means it's going to be a 70-point game. But I'm going to throw some of those bowl angles out that I copied. By the way, I have five pages with the bowl angles. Now, I don't go ahead and play games just because of angles, and I'm not an angle guy when it comes to regular season football, but they tend to play out a little bit more often when it comes to bowl season. Here's some for this one. First of all, we talked about that TCU uh, win over Northern Illinois, a game in which both teams wanted to be there in a minor bowl. Here's another situation. Not only does New Mexico want to be there, this game was created for them to be in a bowl game. <laughs> it's on their home field. And San Jose, obviously, as Jim mentioned, they haven't gone bowling in 16 years, so they're more than happy to be in this contest. So you've got to throw that out of the mix. But teams playing on their home field, went back and looked at that, 8-4, and four, the last 12 straight up, 8-3 and three against the spread mm. with a push in there. Mountain West teams coming into this bowl season, 13-7 and seven against the spread their last 20. And WAC teams were just 5-14 and 14 their last 19 in bowl games. So it kind of tells you a little bit about how these conferences do when it comes to bowl action. Now, here's the one caveat. Here's why you don't just see a bowl angle and you jump headstrong into it. The Mountain West is 13-7. and seven. How many times are they laying more than three points in a bowl game? It doesn't happen much. So you got to be careful and you got to go with the on-field matchups when you talk about a game like this. I, I would guess probably most of the time they're underdogs. Sure, exactly. So they're, they're covering numbers, but yeah. If there was a team that I was going to root for in the bowls and I didn't have if no reason to handicap it, give it out to customers, it would probably be the San Jose team. I love Dick Tomey, one of the best coaches in college football. He's proved it. He's proved it for a number of years, uh, was, uh, didn't coach for a while, came back, and he just did a remarkable job with his team. They were a real mess. The program was a mess. Uh, having said that, though, I think that this the line a little bit short here, three, three and a half points. And uh, New Mexico has some advantage here. Obviously, they played a much, much more difficult slate. Jim, you mentioned home field. Mm -hmm. I mean, just how important is that? And then last but not least, uh, something else about that home field, this tremendous altitude. Uh, a lot of the WAC teams are used to it, but the San Jose squad may find this difficult uh, to, to, to handle, especially yeah. late in the game, which could uh, be helpful for both of us, Jim. Yeah, uh, for what, me, what I is, think New Mexico could cover. There, by the way? You know, I'm not sure exactly it's what like it is. 5,000 feet maybe, or close to you know, I don't like, know. Like a I don't thing? know. You know, I don't know. No. I know it is high, but uh, I think this could this could help New Mexico. I could see them pulling away late because of this altitude, and of course, it could also help your over gym. I think that uh, yeah. when you get teams get tired, it's the defense that tires first, not the offense. So. I, I don't generally like laying points mm. in, in in games like this because you, of all the things that Scott and Glenn both mentioned, it's hard to figure out and determine who's motivated, who's not, who's going to prepare properly, mm. who's just going to party. Uh, so I usually look to the underdog when I can, but when I don't really know what to do with it, I look at the total, and I really like the total in this game. I don't know where you party it. much there uh, in New Albuquerque? Mexico. In Albuquerque. Believe you know, me, to be every town, <laughs> everywhere, there's some place to party. Well, hey, any especially any, anywhere there's a college nearby, <laughs> and, right? And sometimes when there's nothing to do but party, you even party more. Yeah, good you know, point. There's no other recreational <laughs> things to do. <laughs> you know what I like about Dick Tomey? I mean, uh, first of all, you know he owns New Mexico? It's been a while since he's gone against him, but he's like 11-2 and two lifetime against the Lobos from his Hawaii days and things like that. But uh, if you remember when he was the head coach of uh, Desert Swarm, right. remember that back in the early oh. 90s, he had Teddy Bruschi on that Arizona defense. I, I really got tired of his coaching because, man, he had the most incredible defenses, maybe in college football, not just the Pac-10. And you'd never see the guy gamble on offense. And he used to drive me crazy. I, I can't remember which game it was. I, it might have helped that he drove me crazy because I had his team and I lost <laughs> in this particular game. But I'll never forget... In a, in a game in which they trailed by uh, three points, I think it was, and they were, they were like two-point underdogs at the time. There was about five minutes left in the game, and they had a, a fourth and two at the 50 with his defense, and he chose to punt the ball away, trailing with about five minutes to go on his home field with Desert Swarm. And that was in the Teddy Bruschi years, and it kind of irked me about this guy for a long time. But if you get over the loss, you have to realize that this is a very good football coach who's taken a downtrodden program since Jack Elway left many, many moons ago and turned them into a bowl participant. I wonder a little bit if San Jose uh, left their bowl mentality, so to speak, though, in that game against Boise State, that real tough, hard-fought, close loss 
in which they really put a lot into that. That was their championship game, so to speak. And they almost beat the Broncos who were off to the Fiesta Bowl. Uh, so I, I worry about that a little bit. I think, you know, Rocky Long every year does such a fantastic job with New Mexico. You throw away those first four games every year, and this guy just tears it up over the final six or seven games every season. And when you look at what they've overcome, they lost Cole McCamey, their starting quarterback, and a real stud in the Mountain West early in the season. They've actually had to start a third-string quarterback at times in the second half of the year. Still got the job done. Rodney Ferguson not getting enough credit, the running back for New Mexico. And once he got healthy is when the string really started coming together for the Lobos. So I'm going to say because they've got a really nice balance, they've got home field advantage, I would have to lean towards the Lobos. But I also want to go on record saying this is my least favorite bowl game of the entire 32 <laughs> on the slate. Well, we're going to come back with another bowl game, Oklahoma State and Alabama in the Independence Bowl, which I think is going to be a premium game right back. Coming up next, Thursday's Independence Bowl with Oklahoma State and Alabama. But first, a reminder that smoking Dave Koken, who nailed his top seven football releases last Sunday, as well as another best bet right here on the show, to raise his pro line record to an amazing 21 and 6, has a Christmas special you don't want to miss. Available this weekend for just $25 on the website or when you call 1 900 835 9898. Get ready for two powerful under the hat selections plus Dave's Bowl Game of the Year, a game you'll want to be on before the line moves. That's three big games, including Dave's Bowl Game of the Year, right here Saturday on Picks Online or when you make the call to 1 900 835 9898. As I mentioned earlier, Dave is out ill this week. We hope he comes back uh, for next week's show. He does have a big offer this week, and I'm sure his handicapping will not be ill because he has been red hot. He's got two under-the-hat plays this week and a bowl game of the year. All you have to do is call the number on your screen right now or come back to the website. Next bowl game, Oklahoma State-Bama. I find this to be a very interesting game. Bama loses their head coach. Now, I have this thing about teams where they lose their head coach or their offensive and defensive coordinator. I think that's very disruptive. Whether they stay around or not, you know their focus is somewhere else. And now they've got this big bowl game. Well, I don't know if it's a big bowl game for Alabama because they're always disappointed to go to a small bowl game. Uh, Oklahoma State's slight, uh, slight favorite, uh, both six and six clubs. What do you think? I, I think they lost two coaches, Shula and then Rodriguez. So it was like a <laughs> double whammy for this team. I mean, so they thought they... They've they, offered just about... You know what? I've heard rumors they were going to offer you the job. Well, you know what? I don't think I take it. I don't think they can pay me <laughs> enough, to be honest with you. You know what? That's no, understandable. No. But you know, you pick your poison here. You've got you've got a great offensive team against a very strong defensive club. Although Alabama, I think their defense down from last year. But let's face it: over the last couple seasons, 17 of their last 22 games in conference play in the SEC, they've limited teams to 17 points or less. So you know they come to play on on defense. On the other side of the coin, though, Oklahoma State is a terrific offensive club. I mean, they've got balance. They can run and throw the ball. I think they finished eighth in the nation in scoring, so you know they're going to put points on the board. I think the key, though, is the uh, I think off the Alabama offensive line against this defensive line of Oklahoma State. And I have talked to a number of people that feel like uh, Oklahoma State's going to get dominated at the line of scrimmage there. But I tell you what, if you look at their overall numbers in the Big 12, a, a conference that been known to run the football pretty well. I mean, they only give up 4.1 yards per carry, which isn't too bad. I mean, is it terrific? No, it's not going to you know open your eyes, but it's not a bad number. Uh, I think it's a really tough call. A very ex it's an excellent game for a lower tier bowl. Great matchups between two good programs, but two good programs and two good conferences. Mm. This isn't like you know you have this no. elite conference against a small conference. These are two. Very good conferences, Scott. And if I look at try to see who's more motivated to be here, I guess I would lean towards Oklahoma State. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, one of the things people can do at home is, and this is a good read. It sounds, you know, a little bit too easy or t to be true, but go to each team's hometown newspaper a couple of days before the game and see who sold the tickets because mm -hmm. that'll tell you which team, by their fan support, is excited to be in this particular bowl game. And Oklahoma State, last I checked, uh, had a lot more fans buying up the tickets for this game than, than Alabama did. Of course, the Crimson Tide were spoiled for many, many years, uh, always playing for a national championship, and they've been down now for the last several years since Stallings left, basically. They haven't been a real solid national championship contender. Uh, they do have their defensive coordinator coaching this game as an interim coach, and, and the players do like him, and I think they will rally around him enough to where they're focused enough to prepare for this Oklahoma State team. The Cowboys are a different animal home and away, though. I mean, if you look at what they do in Stillwater, they're incredible. That offense is outstanding 
on their home field. Not quite the same when they venture outside of the state of Oklahoma. You know, they were good enough to almost beat the Oklahoma Sooners. They were good enough to thrash Nebraska after falling down 17 nothing in that, in that game down in Stillwater. So you, the, Alabama, though, you mentioned on the offense, gosh, it's kind of like my fondue offense of college football. <laughs> you can dip in. You're never quite sure what you're going to get out. And that's a little scary when you're talking about back at a football team with your cash. So I lean towards Oklahoma State here. Again, not a real big play for me in the bowl games. Uh, a Darius Bowman is a superstar of the future in the pros. This guy's got about 60 grabs on the year. They were my uh, college football game of the year, by the way, this year, when they beat Baylor 66-24. And I found an interesting stat that I included in that write-up about Bowman. It's, he's over 90% of his catches, and like I mentioned, he's got about 60. About 90% of those have gone for first downs or touchdowns. Wow. That's incredible. That I means this, this guy's putting up Jack Snow-type numbers as far as yeah. yards per catch, 16, 17 yards per grab. So that's going to be a lot for Alabama to handle if they're not completely focused for this game. I've got to lean on Oklahoma State here. I'm not sure when you mentioned the, you know, the, how well Oklahoma State played at home. They almost beat the Sooners. Then you said they topped Nebraska. Were you implying that that was a big win for them? Or, uh, <laughs> what are you, what are you trying to say? You trying to hurt me again? Are you picking on Nebraska again? No, no, no. You already no. picked on the girls I, I, think, I don't think people realize my father was born in Nebraska. I'm a big Nebraska What happened fan to you? Yeah. <laughs> we moved to Seattle. <laughs> this is why we separated them this week, guys. And, uh, we got another game coming up, another bowl game, the Inside Bowl, Minnesota and Texas Tech. Be right back. Coming up next Friday's Insight Bowl between Minnesota and Texas Tech. But first, we'll hear from Scott Spreitzer, who won his non-conference hammer game of the year Saturday with Ohio State and his pro football game of the year on Sunday with the New England Patriots, as well as finishing up the college football regular season on a 70% winning run and who is featuring his December trifecta of the month. Well, welcome back, everybody. Talking more bowl action in just a moment. But, hey, let's talk about all the winners we've had since late October, early November at Smash Mouth Sports, it's been a fantastic run in pro football. We had our huge game of the year last week, an easy win, 40-7 to with New England over Houston. Jumped out early, never looked back. Great spot, and they came through for us. In college basketball, we hit our non-conference hammer of the year with the Ohio State Buckeyes. They ended up winning by 22 after building a 34-point lead over in-state rival Cincinnati. We are now 16-5, and 76% against the spread on college basketball Saturdays for the month of December. And we're wrapping it all into one huge package today. It's my trifecta of the month for December. It's available for 8 bucks at 1-800-521-1872. I am releasing my college basketball non-conference TKO game of the year as we amp it up a notch. You'll get my pro football line error game of the month and you'll get my college football TKO bowl game of the month. It's all available right now for just eight bucks. And again, all you have to do is call 1-800-521-1872. Wanted to mention we're off to a winning start again in the bowls. We had TCU in the Poinsettia Bowl, easy winner. We're on a 26 and 11, 70% run in college football. So don't miss out. 1-800-521-1872. Just eight bucks for the trifecta of the month. And now back to the bowls, Minnesota, Texas Tech, Jim. Absolutely. Minnesota, Texas Tech, the bowl committee had to have a, a lot of fun with this. We have a running team in Minnesota against the passing team in Texas Tech. Texas Tech is the favorite. The game's in Tempe, Arizona. The way I look at this, I don't see that either team will be able to stop the other team. As far as who's going to be encouraged about being here, I have no idea, but I really like it. The offense is to open it up quite wide here. This is what you call one of those tennis matches, you know, where you're back and forth, back and forth. I agree with the gym. I think a I think there's a real good chance for an over here. I mean, let's face it, uh, Texas Tech has got one of the best passing offenses in the nation. I think they finished third. Uh, they're up against a Minnesota pass defense, playing in the Big Ten, which isn't the best place to learn how to play pass defense. Uh, and yet they were still 115th in the nation, almost one of the worst right. teams in the country defending the pass. On the other side, you've got a Minnesota team that can run the football. They go for over 150 yards a game. And guess what? That same 150 comes up on the defensive side because that's how many yards Tech gives up on the ground. So I think we'll have a, I think we'll have a game that goes up and down and uh, up and down the field, and, and there'll be plenty of points scored. Interesting. Here. I mean, you have a pretty good-sized line on this game, six, six and a half. Mm -hmm. They both are kind of equal in the, in the kind of records they, they, they have for the season. So there has to be a reason they're favoring Texas Tech by such a wide margin, and it's probably that passing game and Minnesota's inability to stop the pass. 
Well, I think what's going to happen is, like Glenn just said, it's going to be point after point after point in this one, a lot of touchdowns to be scored. You try to break it down from who's interested in being here angle. Mm. I think Minnesota's got to get the edge there of who's interested to be here because at one point of the season, they didn't look like they were going bowling. Uh, Texas Tech had, again, bigger and higher aspirations than to be playing in this game and to, you know, to be coming in with this record. So I would have to lean towards Minnesota from that angle. But as far as my play itself, I've got to take the over. I think Glenn hit it on the head. Both strengths on offense play into the other team's weakness on defense, and I think you're going to see a game that lands in the, probably the low to mid-70s. You made a good point about Minnesota being the team that probably is more excited about being here because they had pretty much shut down any thoughts of, of postseason mm -hmm. play uh, with three games left, and they, they swept their last three contests. Having said that, though, I think that uh, once in a while, and you mentioned this in our first segment, sometimes that consideration has already been taken by the lines maker and I think they've built that into there because I think talent wise this is a bit of a mismatch I think this line could have been as, as much as uh, eight or nine uh, before you figured in the fact that Tech's probably a little disappointed in where they ended up absolutely I, I look for a high scoring game we're in a consensus on this one uh, NFL there's a lot of games in the NFL that have uh, meaning for the playoffs and we're gonna come back and talk about uh, another football game the Chargers at the very disappointed and disappointing Seahawks. Be right back. In a moment, the Chargers take on the Seahawks in Seattle this Sunday. But first, world champion handicapper Jim Feist, who is coming off his NFC North Game of the Year with the Green Bay Packers over Detroit and who has been red hot with his college hoops and football selections all season long, has a huge two-day, three-play special. My college football season has been outstanding, and that includes 70% winners in my Game of the Year selections. Last week, I had Green Bay in the NFC North game. That was a game of the year as well, another big winner. This week, I have a three-game offer guaranteed if all three games don't win, you get the executive service for December absolutely free. Here's what you get in those three games. Huge Saturday Bowl winner, my first college basketball game of the year release, and Sunday's pro underdog of the month. Here's what you have to do. Now, this is only available either late Friday night or on Saturday. Go to Picks Online. Or make the phone call, a $29 call, to 1-900-772-9991 for this three-game offer guaranteed to win or the December executive service is absolutely free. Now, we have a big game in the NFL. San Diego, awesome football team. Everybody's saying this may be the best team in football. LT at running back, the rookie quarterback. A little questionable there. He hasn't been playing that well. They're going against Seattle who is just not playing well. They're certainly not the team they were a year ago when they went to the Super Bowl. What do you think, Scott? Well, you know, you look at uh, Phillip Rivers, since you brought that up about maybe not playing as well as he was earlier in the season, had a couple of missteps lately, including last week. He had the 9 for 23, two interception performance, no, no touchdowns through the air. And, I mean, that was about as close to a non-cover for San Diego as you're going to get. I mean, when Kansas City blocked the punt inside the San Diego 20 and then Bozo touch the football past the line of scrimmage and Seattle got the ball or San Diego got the ball back and they were able to run Tomlinson for 84 yards and get the touchdown and other than that Kansas City was right in the mix with a bad offense uh, this week they're going to go up against a team that says we got to get our swagger back the problem is they haven't had swagger since the Super Bowl I mean the swagger has been gone because of injuries this entire season for Seattle listen I got trapped into thinking Seattle was in a great spot last week that Thursday night game at home against San Francisco and if you watch that game and it was funny I was talking to a friend at the time they were playing in the second quarter they were up seven zip they show a, a total yardage uh, graphic at that point of the game with about four minutes to go in the half and it was something like 150 to 40 in favor of Seattle they were up only seven nothing uh, they had the ball about a third down and five at the San Francisco 40 yard line and Jeremy Stevens reared his ugly head they threw a pass to him wide open at the 15 he drops it they punt the ball a few plays later, here's a, a field goal to give San Francisco some momentum instead of being 14 nothing Seattle and likely on their way to a victory. So I make it a long-winded point here in trying to say that the best player for San Diego this week is probably Seattle tight end Jeremy Stevens mm -hmm. because any time this team needs a first down out of their tight end, you can count on Jeremy Stevens to drop the ball, bottom line. And he's catching it with his chest instead of his hands. He's not extending. He, he's just a mess right now as far as his confidence uh, Daryl Jackson's banged up. He's got the hyperextended toe right now. I mean, it's, I want to back Seattle here, and you keep looking for San Diego go-against spots. Thought we had one last week. They still came through. We did get away with going against them and took Buffalo, Buffalo a couple of weeks ago, 
and got a backdoor cover with the Bills in that 24-21 game. But, boy, it's tough. I think the better play in this one is to take the over. You've got a Seattle defense that hasn't stopped any, anybody. You look at the last 11 or 12 games, I mean, they're giving up about 30 points per game in the last 11 or 12 games. They have not held anybody under 20 points over that time span. I think their offense will be a little bit better this week. But San Diego at the same time, they're still playing for something, Jim. They're playing for home field advantage throughout the uh, playoffs. Well, they want to stay one. They are one, one game ahead of, of uh, Indianapolis and, and Baltimore. And Baltimore has the tiebreaker because they have beaten San Diego earlier in the year. So if they would stumble and Baltimore wins out, Baltimore would get the home field as long as they kept winning. So that's a dangerous spot. Yeah, at first you'd think that maybe Seattle has the advantage here incentive-wise because they, all of a sudden with this bad streak at the end of the season, all of a sudden San Francisco is coming up behind them. Realistically, though, uh, while this doesn't bode well for should Seattle get into the playoffs because they'll have no momentum, but really they could lose their last two games. San Francisco would still have to win their final two. Mm -hmm. the, the scenario is very unlikely. On the other hand, you've got a team, as you mentioned, a team that here at San Diego that needs to keep winning because they love to play at home throughout. Let's face it, if it came down to a Baltimore-San Diego game, you would sure want to play in sunny San Diego as opposed to playing in a cold Baltimore nah. site too. You know, Especially so. <laughs> since you've already gone there and, and exactly. lost in better weather. Exactly. But, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time and I've <clears throat> Always heard the media talk about playing for the best record, home field advantage, et cetera, et cetera. But it's kind of like running a marathon. And, and you, get, you get to the finish line, and you cross the finish line, you feel great, and then they tell you you have to run another five miles. <laughs> you know, and that's what sort of happens with these teams that clinch the playoffs. San Diego hasn't played that great, even though they covered against Kansas City, and they did blow the back door covered against, uh, Buffalo. against ba uh, Buffalo. So when you look at that, you say, well, maybe this team is vulnerable because they continue to win and they've made themselves vulnerable to the spread the last couple of weeks. Well, you, I mean, you, this is a spot where you kind of want to play a home underdog getting some generous points, four, four and a half points. The problem is, though, that I, I, I really liken the Seattle defense to, to the Colts defense in a way. It's built on speed, athleticism. They're really quick. Their linebackers are tremendous. But this team doesn't have a lot of size on defense. Now you're up against LT, a team that can run the football real well, and I'm just afraid Seattle's just not going to be able to stop. Be real careful about good. laying points on the road this year. It's mm -hmm. well over 60% home dogs covering the spread. Well, especially in pro when those football. home dogs are winning teams. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, a, and that's, that's what you got this remarkable week. Remarkable record. Yeah. You have a winning team getting points at home. It's a very tough spot. The the, the, okay. the what you got to do it's simple. You stop at Ladanian Tomlinson. You beat the San Diego. It's simple. It's, it's nothing to it. I they, mean, you just, but here's the problem. They the could, guy's but damn nobody's good. Nobody's ever done this since the kid was <laughs> exactly. in grade school. I mean, this kid. Nobody could stop Ladanian Tomlinson. And here's the problem. Except, except the coach the last couple of years when he decided he wouldn't use him that Marty much. Marty Schottenheimer when he forgot who he right. was. Not this year. But he's not forgetting so. this year. He no, learned his lesson. No, he He'll wait till the playoffs this year. <laughs> but, you know, when you look at the, the defense for Seattle, you think, okay, you, you shut down. Ladanian Tomlinson in Kansas City, except for one run, did a pretty good, decent job last week of holding him in check, except for that one run when it seemed like maybe the team was down after that block punt. They just caught him at the right time. You shut him down if you can at all, if you slow him down at least. Then you put the onus of the offense on Rivers. And, I, boy, he's too emotional. Have you seen him? I saw him last week in a, uh, throwing a ball and getting an um, illegal grounding call against him, the ball around midfield on a third down play, and it was obvious. I mean, it was obvious to everybody watching it on TV in the stadium, the players, and he went nuts on the field at the officials. He's a very emotional player. He's a trash talker. And if you can slow Ladinian Tomlinson, I think you can get inside Rivers' head right now. But that's saying a lot because not only is it tough to slow him when you're healthy, but Seattle's defensive tackles are banged up. It, it's a tough situation this week. I mean, the San Diego team is, I mean, man for man, this is the best team in football. If they don't stub their toe somewhere, either Marty pulls something funny mm -hmm. or there's an injury or they – a, you know, an unlucky player, an on, a bad call by an official, or Rivers mm -hmm. just blowing up at the end because he is, after all, a rookie. So, I mean, when you look at this, uh, this uh, offensive team, just look at the offensive. you got Gates. you got mm -hmm. the, you can not only have LT, but you've got a couple of running Deep backs that, they can, they, that can do some damage. The tough spot, uh, I'd favor the home dog uh, in this mm -hmm. spot, though, because, because of the situation. And you've got to mention the weather. Uh, I'd say there's probably a 99% chance it'll be raining in, in uh, Seattle because it always rains in Seattle. Got any power in the game, by the way? I mean, geez, I mean, everybody's been out of power in Seattle. Over 100,000 people, I, I think, still after last week's storm. So check out the weather reports in that game. Always a big deal up there. And I just wanted to mention, you started saying they've got a couple of good running backs for San Diego. Their fullback made the Pro Bowl, yeah. and it was announced the other day. And here's a guy 
who keeps the defensive tackles from doing their job because defensive tackles are there to take out the first blocker so the linebackers can come up and stop the running back. Well, you've got a fullback who's cleared out defensive tackles and linebackers and opening up some nice holes for LT, so he's got to get his just due also. Absolutely. We're going to come back with the best bets. They've been hot the last few weeks. Stay tuned. Coming up next are Pro-Line Best Bets, the biggest selection from today's show. For my best bet, we'll look at one of the games we talked about here on the show, New Mexico. We're going to take them, the Lobos, over San Jose State. Now, it's been a great run in college and pro basketball since week one of the season. Up 93 units in the NBA, 190 units of profit in college basketball since November 26th. Now, I'm going to give you three college size highlighted by my TV Game of the Month Saturday. Plus, you're going to get details on how to get my chalkboard Game of the Month in pro basketball and my side in one of the bowl games, Saturday's Fort Worth Bowl between Utah and Tulsa. All free, five big games, 1-800-531-7069. Well, my best bet is the battle down in Albuquerque to go over that San Jose State and New Mexico in Saturday's bowls. It's my trifecta of the month. Right now it's Smash Mouth Sports for eight bucks at 1-800-521-1872. And that trifecta includes my pro football line error game of the month, my TKO game of the month in the college football bowls, Plus, you're going to get my TKO game of the year in college basketball. All three plays, only eight bucks. Also, be sure to inquire about my college football bowl game of the year. It's all available right now, 800-521-1872. My best bet is the Minnesota-Texas Tech game to go over. It's in Arizona. I figure there's going to be pretty good weather. you got the running game for Minnesota against the passing game for Texas Tech. Neither team knows how to stop the other club. Look for it to fly over. I have an offer I want you to go to. Uh, picks online and get the offer there either Friday night or Saturday and you get three big games they're all guaranteed or the rest of December's executive service is absolutely free or you can call 1-900-772-9991 $29 now as far as next week is concerned I want you to tune in because we're going to cover the big bowls we're going to co go to the Rose, the Fiesta, the Orange and the Sugar Bowl it doesn't get any better than this you got college hoops, you've got pro hoops, you've got pro football, and you've got all these great bowl games. Let's have a winning week. Good health to everybody. Merry Christmas to everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching us this week, and be sure to catch a special version of the Pro-Line Show featuring the Rose Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl, all starting next Wednesday.